Joining me is the panel, Liberal Senator James Patterson, former Liberal MP, Fiona Scott. Fiona, um, what's Barry Jicklin up to here, do you think? Is she just buying time, hoping that, you know, the heat dies down, or is she genuinely trying to find some compromise? Yeah, well, good evening, Andrew. I, I think Gladys Berejiklian is trying to find some compromise, but the shame here is that the horses have bolted. And at the end of the day, this was a legislation put together by the independent member for Sydney, Alex Greenwich. Uh, yes, it was co-sponsored by her health minister and pushed through the House by, by the leader of the House in Andrew Constance. Now, it has passed the House, but look, there's been a lot of remarks made in regard to various parts of the bill that people aren't comfortable with and the process of it is really what's let this bill down. Now, if you look at the way many of these things happen and the processes that take place in these bills, it is quite a normal process for this type of a legislation to go through a, a joint standing committee in, in a federal capacity or a joint select committee committee in a state capacity and and I think in many ways this is what is needed. It, it is needed that you have the community uh, speak out about this. I remember as a member myself when you know talking about same-sex marriage and and the importance there it's really important that all the stakeholders and people who have very strong opinions about these types of issues have their voice and and can be heard and, and like the issue but, uh, around this the gender yeah, of but the this child. was uh, this was a take it or leave it. You know, we'll tell uh, the public what's good for them. Um, look, uh, James, uh, Fiona's talked about faults in the process, but in the end, there's a content involved here, a moral content. How does New South Wales have a liberal health minister that says yes to a bill that says we can abort babies up to well the day before natural term, we can let babies who are born alive accidentally in abortion, we can just let them die, and we can allow uh, killing of babies uh, because of the uh, fetuses because of the wrong gender. Andrew, I wish I could help offer some insight into the thinking of the Berejiklian government or the health minister on this bill, but I really can't. It mystifies me as to why uh, they chose to proceed this, with this issue so soon after the election and effectively hand over the New South Wales Parliament, control of the Parliament over to the crossbench and the Greens on an issue uh, that wasn't raised in the election campaign and, and, as far as I'm aware, from my distant spot in Victoria, uh, not subject to a groundswell of demand from the public. Now, it's really weird, but uh, Fiona, you know, there'll be people saying, oh, you're a men, you can't uh, opine on this. Can provisions like I've just outlined be somehow subsumed into the argument, well, listen, you know, it really in the end is a woman's right to choose. And if she chooses those things that I've just outlined, sex selection, uh, aborting a child one, one day before term, uh, fine. I, is that how simple it is? Yeah, look, Andrew, I'm not quite across the legislation to know those intricate details in, in that sort of a space, and I wouldn't really want, want to comment on that. And I think that's the whole issue of this bill. I mean, I know Peter Credlin had Tanya Davies on earlier where uh, she made a, an observation that there were people drawing up with pencil amendments to this bill on the floor. Now, these sorts of drafting issues, when you've had a bill essentially drafted by an independent member of parliament, it is going to be a bill that is, you know, as holy as, as Swiss cheese. Now, now, this is one of the challenges with this bill. No one is debating as to moving abortion from the criminal code to the health code. That is an important thing. But surely, if the Premier was going down this line, surely she should have started with a committee process. It should have been drafted by the health minister, not by some independent... <laughs> You know, yeah, but the health minister wing. ticked off on it. In the end, he put his name to it That's and he true. must bear the responsibility for that. Now, but uh, James, the same question to you. Um, a woman's right to choose, does that mean we've got nothing more to say? Well, Andrew, I saw in, in this debate one Liberal MP in support of the bill said that he felt ashamed as a middle-aged white man that he was even being had an opportunity to express an opinion on this. And I was thinking, well, Parliament's probably not the job for you, buddy, if, you're being, if you don't feel comfortable expressing your opinion about things. And I'm not quite sure what your age or your ethnicity has to do. Would a young black man be more equipped to express an opinion uh, on, on abortion? Um, it, it's, a, it's a very strange debate. Who was the idiot that said that? I honestly don't recall his name. He's not I'm a memorable person. I'm going to look that person. up. I mean, that is pretty sick. Yeah. I mean, surely uh, human life is something of interest to all people, and you have all the moral stake in it. 
Uh, I do believe a man is responsible for half that human life, although, yes, a woman's right to choose is still a big factor for me. But um, I don't know if it uh, takes away all the other arguments I've outlined. Fiona, we've seen students here from communist China stage violent protests, particularly in Melbourne and Brisbane, against supporters of Hong Kong and of the freedom there. But um, the Chinese government has now backed this political activity on our soil and it said uh, it is totally understandable and reasonable for Chinese students and other Chinese citizens uh, overseas to express indignation and opposition against such words and deeds that attempt to separate China, uh, believing that Hong Kong is part of China, and smear its image. Second, we also hope that overseas Chinese can express their patriotism and the Chinese government asks overseas Chinese to observe local laws and regulations. What do you make of that statement? Uh, look, I'm not sure what to make of that statement, Andrew. And, and really, I mean, the, the, the conduct of China at the moment in, in regard to the issues in Hong Kong, in regard to what they've done right through the, the, the South Pacific and, and the debt crisis that has been so many of our South Pacific neighbours. Um, look, th th there's a lot of concerns with the undue influence that, Chinese, that the Chinese government is trying to push right through Australia. Look, I I'm also concerned the, the way in which the Chinese government reacted to Andrew Hastie last week, whereby, you know, they felt that they could could make comment on what a member of our parliament has to say. Whether you agree with Andrew or not, I think there's something wrong where the Chinese government believes that they can just, you know, make comments or apply pressure to, to Australia and the way things are run here. Now, what do you think, uh, James? Uh, the Chinese government saying it's totally understandable, reasonable Chinese students uh, who are not Australian citizens, may I point out, to express indignation, opposition, uh, and go out there and show their patriotism in uh, rallies that have, uh, this stage, turned uh, to violence. Well, Andrew, I hope that the Chinese Communist Party practice at home what they preach at ab abroad <laughs> and allow uh, both points of view to be uh, fa faithfully and peacefully um, represented uh, at home So you think if I went to Tiananmen Square and started protesting against, I don't know, Tibet <laughs> I or something... I wouldn't advise you did that, Andrew. <laughs> and, Andrew, you can only hold the Chinese government to their own word. Apparently expressing, uh, you know, views on public topics is, is a welcome and fine thing to do. So I'm sure they'll respect your right to do that. Gosh almighty, it's a strange world. But Fiona, like, you're speaking of China and its growing influence, you know, uh, I'm starting to get really nervous. Here we have Papua New Guinea now saying it wants $1.5 billion from Australia to help finance its 200, uh, you know, this year's budget, which again is in the red, or else they suggest helpfully they might have to go elsewhere. And elsewhere, we assume, because it uh, means China, because uh, a week or two ago the government... This PNG government reportedly asked China to refinance its entire debt. Now, essentially, this is blackmail. You know, give us the money or we'll go to China. Should we give in? Well, well firstly, Maurice Payne has said that that, that the report of the ABC today and the $1.5 billion is not completely accurate. So we're not sure what it actually is. Um, uh, the PNG government has said that they do want this for uh, infrastructure and roads and what have you. Where I'm concerned here, Andrew, is that, you know, P Papua New Guinea at one stage was, was an Australian territory. We, we fought, the first VC ever handed out to Australia was, of course, you know, handed out for, for battles in, in regard to Kokoda. It is a pilgrimage. I myself have, have trekked Kokoda. Now, now, there is strategic reasons why Port Moresby and places like Papua New Guinea we would not want to see have other sort of foreign influences as opposed to being the free country that Papua New Guinea currently is. And in many ways, if, if this is true and there is a degree of this type of money being offered by Papua New Guinea saying give it to us or otherwise we're getting it from the Chinese, that is of great concern. And once again, it, it shows the way the Chinese are really, really standing over so many of our South Pacific neighbours. Yeah, well, we really had uh, the former uh, Prime Minister or President of uh, Kiribati say just yesterday, the day before, you know, if Australia doesn't come good, uh, we could go to China. You know, they might be uh, the lesser of two evils. I mean, what on earth is going on here? 
Well, Andrew, uh, Australia is by far the largest donor, overseas aid donor, to Papua New Guinea, and Papua New Guinea is one of the largest destinations of our overseas aid. So Six hundred million dollars a year. We very, give very generous. Six hundred million dollars uh, in a year. our support of Papua New Guinea, uh, as we should be as a near neighbour. And one of the good things this government has done is refocus our global aid program back to our region, brought it from mm. the rest of the world, where I'm sure it was doing good, but really our interests lie in our immediate backyard, and particularly in supporting our near neighbours uh, to make sure that we are there to support them, and there's no need for them to go elsewhere for support. But the idea of give us money for our budget, uh, the money we give, because Papua New Guinea is a fabulously corrupt country, <laughs> is in direct aid. Like we direct and supervise our own projects. Uh, they want the money for their budget, which is a slightly different thing. Well, I think Australian aid should both help those that it goes to, but also serve our national interest and serve our values and make sure that... Yeah, it does serve our national interest to give it to, to, to uh, you know, Papua New Guinea's politicians who say, if you don't, we might go to China. Well, I don't think we should ever respond to that kind of negotiation. It's not a very good way to start a negotiation. Uh, Fiona, what do you think? Yeah, look, I agree with everything James said. And, look, I can only also take Maurice Payne at her word to say that it's not necessarily accurate. And I'm sure that over the next coming days we will get a, an idea of what is accurate. But either way, the fact that this has been put into the media cycle, one must ask where and why. And, you know, surely maybe there, there is a sniff of something here where, you oh, know, the PNG is. government's really pushing for something. Yeah, well, as I say, it's no accident that it comes a day after uh, uh, Atoli Tong uh, from uh, Kiribati was uh, suggesting that we stump up for global warming uh, money or, or else they might go to China. Um, there is a real concern here. Um, the Morrison government, uh, James, uh, it, the Cabinet today discussed draft proposals for uh, laws uh, to protect uh, faith-based or faith organisations from... Uh, religious discrimination. Now, the protections involve, apparently, exempting religious organisations from discrimination law. So, I presume they can hire someone who's not Christian, for instance, or not Muslim, for instance, um, or they can say something that might otherwise a uh, gender activist might take them to a tribunal for. Do we actually need more protections like that? In an ideal world, Andrew, you wouldn't need these things. Civil society would just sort it out and we'd accept the reality of pluralism, which means we live in a society where people have different sets of values and leave each other to pursue our own uh, vision of a good life. Um, that would be an ideal world. Unfortunately, it's a long time since we've lived in an ideal world like that, if we ever have, Andrew. And sadly, there are some people who seek to use the state to enforce their values on others. They seek to use anti-discrimination law, for example, at the state level to say, you can't think that, you can't say that, you can't act like that, because it's against my moral code, rather than just saying, well, you go ahead and live your life your way and I'll live my life, life, my life mine. Um, so I think, sadly, it is necessary, uh, and I think Christian Porter has done a very good job at getting that Turn careful balance right. Uh, Fiona, do we need them? Look, I think, sadly, Andrew, we do. And, you know, I mean, it, it would be great if we could turn the clock back to a point where it was truly small government. And But whilst we have, you know, pieces of legislation like 18C, which is about race discrimination and, yes, has a very low benchmark, I'm sure you'd agree with, with some of the yes. early aspects of, you know, to offend and insult are very, very, very easy to hit. I mean, then, of course, it, it opens it up to then potentially broadening it to gender or sexual yeah, look, orientation or I know. a whole look, there range are just of other... too many. There are just too many of these uh, laws and I think we should repeal them rather than add more to them. Fiona Scott, James Patterson, thank you both so much for your time.